Judges, chapter 6. God is good, amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Judges, chapter 6, beginning with the first verse, the word of God, praise him to the Lord, says this. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would go up against them. And they would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted. So they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. Now, let me just talk about this. What does this have to do with us? Well, in the first verse, it tells us that the Israelites were in trouble because of their sin. How many people have been in trouble because of your sin before? All right, just keep your hand in the air. Look around. Look at the perfect people that aren't raising their hand up. Whoa! You can learn from them. Matter of fact, they might be preaching this, this, this Wednesday. Maybe we'll let them come. I'm just playing. No, really, but if, 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 living a, if living a life or a moment of sin has caused you grief or turmoil, go ahead and put your hand in there. All right, everybody look around, all right? And so just look at your neighbor and say, I am normal, <laughs> right? Yeah. Woo! I, I, thought, I thought I was going to come to church today and be told I was the worst thing God ever created. No, you're just as bad as everybody else in this room. Because, listen, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. The good news is, the good news is it's, it's not our expectation that we should be living up to. It's, it's the standard of Christ living and working in us. Can you say amen to that? And so we just give God praise that it's his standard, not ours, right? And so the first verse tells us that the Israelites, they're in trouble because of their sin. Now, if you're taking notes, jot this down. Sin never produces good fruit. Sin is never the option, man. It, it never should be anyway the option that we choose. I mean, it should never be one of our boxes that we want to check, right? I, of course, sin is always there, but it should never be an option that we want to consider. It should never be something that we consider an option in our lives. And so sin never produces good fruit. Sin, let me tell you what it does. Sin is always causing separation between me and God. All right, I'm just going to talk personally. Sin is always causing separation between God and myself. And it's the same way in your life. You're no different. Sin is trying to separate you uh, from, 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 from the Father. Let me just tell you. Sin never unites, it always divides. Sin never unifies, it's always separating. And this is the great problem with it. It's, it, it, it's, it, it's a mighty divider. Jot this down, Isaiah 59, 1, 2. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2 says this, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear dull, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, your sin, have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Now, you say, wait a minute, is that contradicting itself? It says that God always hears, but then it says that he doesn't hear. Let me tell you what's going on here. Have you ever been mad with your spouse? Before you got mad, you heard everything they were saying. But once you got mad, you were hearing but no longer listening, or you were listening and no longer hearing, however you want to say it. Amen. And it just became like, wah, 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 wah. Amen. Nope, they done ticked you off. And so, listen, if, if we can understand that on a worldly sense of view, how much more the heart of God, God God's not congratulating us when we do wrong. Nope. It says... It's not that the hand of God has been shortened so that he cannot save us. It's that our own actions has caused a chain of reactions. And this is exactly what it's talking about with the Israelite people right here. The only reason, and I'm going to say this, the only reason 
Midian has control, it's not because he's some strong brute of a man or a people. No, 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 it's because the Israelites messed up, and because they messed up, they're suffering consequences. The consequence to Israel had a name, and it was Midian. And this is who, this is just who God is using in this chapter of the lives of the Israelites. Amen. Let me talk to you what, uh, about something that A.W. Tozer said concerning sin. This is really good. A.W. Tozer said this, and I quote, A man by his sin may waste himself, which is to waste that which on earth is most like God. That is man's greatest tragedy and God's heaviest grief, unquote. Now I want you to consider that. A man by his sin can waste himself. And it says to waste that which on earth is most like God. You and I, we were made in the image of God. And so this is why it says it grieves the heart of God. Tozer, Tozer says it grieves the heart of God for a person to just give themselves over to sin because it ultimately, Scripture says, leads to what? Death. Amen. And so the Israelite sin produced very hard times for them. However, however, how many people know that God will use hard times in order to turn us back to him? Yeah. Right, right, right. And so all those people just a moment ago that raised their hand and said that they, they had messed up and something was happening, here's the good news. God is a great restorer. Amen? God is a great redeemer. Amen? How many people know Jesus heals our hearts? He heals our minds. He's not just in it to save my soul. He's in it to grow me with him. I mean, I'm so blessed. I'm so thankful that he set me apart. And you as a church, if you're following him, right, he set you apart. So it's not like it's a one and done. We get saved and we're just waiting to perish. In the process of waiting to go home or him come to get me, whatever takes place first, he's refining me. And he's redefining what I thought was normal. Amen? How many people, when you got saved, you understood what new normal was? It's like, oh, okay, I can't do that no more. Right? The Holy Spirit moves in. You do something that you used to do, and all of a sudden you get convicted, and it hurts. It's like, oh, I shouldn't be saying that no more. Amen. Oh, I shouldn't be thinking that about them no more. Right? Oh, I shouldn't be acting like that no more. Amen. Oh, I should not let that get worked up. Oh, I shouldn't be watching that no more. I shouldn't be listening to that no more. It's a constant change. It's a constant change. Verse 6. If you look at Judges 6.6, 6, verse 6 tells us that the Israelites cried out to God for help. The Israelites cried out to God for help. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Go to Psalm 18, verse 6. Go to the 18th Psalm. And you're going to look, if you will, go with me to the 6th verse. How many people have cried out for something in your life before? It meant a lot to you. Well, this, last week, last week, Pastor Jim and I were at the home. My wife made us a meal. We're in the kitchen, and she's cutting up lettuce. Well, when I was, when I was a boy, I would go around, and I would, I would come in from outside, want a snack. And my mom would tell you, I would go into the fridge. I'd open up the produce section of the fridge, and I'd go down there and grab a fistful of lettuce, rip it off, and I'd go out the door just snacking on lettuce. I don't know why, I just really enjoy handfuls of lettuce. So the wife's cutting lettuce, and she cuts, she cuts the tail end of it off, you know, where it grows out the ground, and that's where the hard, crispy lettuce is. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I don't care if it's soft or hard. Hey, it's, lettuce is good. Lettuce, it's cold, it's wet, I like it, it's good. So I'm sitting there snacking off of that, I'm sitting there snacking off of that waste piece that she's fitting to throw away, and I'm trying to get the most off of it that I can get. And I got a mouthful. I have a, literally, I have, a, I have a fistful that I have jammed in my mouth. And she's taking it across the kitchen to go to the trash. Although I can't, I want to tell her what I want to say. I just can't get it out. And so I'm like, hey, hey, hey. And what I'm, what I'm really saying is, hey, boo-boo, don't throw that lettuce away. I'm going to eat it. And she just keeps walking. And then all of a sudden, since I couldn't get out what I wanted to say, I started clapping. 
and this is what I got. I am not an animal. I, I know, and I didn't mean it to be disrespectful, but I'm just trying to cry out to you to say, bring my letters back. <laughs> I can say this. There's never been one time in my life that God did not answer a plea. You see, it's always a yes or a no. And I know the old cliche goes, but it is the truth. No's can be answers too. No's, no's can be answers too. Matter of fact, sometimes no's can be better than a yes. Amen. Many times no's can be better than a yes. So look at Psalm 18. Look at the 18th Psalm, verse, uh, verse 6. The psalmist says, In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. And my cry to him reached his ears. And he said, wait a minute, it just said that those that were trapped in sin and they got pushed away, that God doesn't hear. No, 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 God always hears. Amen. Matter of fact, the Bible also says that the righteous cry out for help and God restores and rescues them. Amen. And so this is really good news for people that are hungry for God because we're all going to make mistakes, right? We're all going to make choices and decisions that don't honor the Father. But the thing is, where's our heart at? Where's it lined up for, man? If, if we're hungry and thirsty for more of God, I'm telling you, he's going to give it to you. David wrote this psalm testifying to and giving thanks to God for rescuing him from the hands of the enemies and also the hand of Saul. This psalm comes from that. It is, it is delivered. It is derived from there. And so listen to me, what we cannot do is get so heavily burdened with our sin what we cannot do is get so heavily burdened with our problems in life that we forget to cry out to God for help. He's the first one. He's the first one we should go for. I've seen something on social media this week, and it said this. Reach for your Bible more than you reach for your phone. Man, how, how, we've, so, how we've become so accustomed to picking that phone up. It, it's just become like a third arm, hasn't it? I, we've just become so accustomed to the entertainment that the phone brings, the, the cheap value that the phone brings. It, it, it is like, like it or love it. Unfortunately, it has become part of who we are now. I want to encourage you, reach back out for the word of God. See, here's the truth. Satan is going to try to do many things and use many things to distract us from the calling of God upon our lives. And he's going to try to do many things to distract us from calling out to God in a circumstance in our life. When David was being attacked, listen to this, when David was being attacked, he cried out to God, even though he did not see the victory right away. How many people know sometimes victory takes time, right? I mean, in a boxing match, in a boxing match, there's many different rounds, and sure, we'd all love to go out and knock out the enemy in the first round, but it don't always happen like that, does it? And sometimes, sometimes the match uh, can, go, can go right up, the bout can go right up to the very end. But listen to me, church, listen. Just because you don't see victory right away, just because you don't feel victorious in the moment, doesn't mean you're not the victor. Amen. You may not feel, you may not feel like a winner this morning, Amen. but it doesn't mean that you're not. It, do, it doesn't mean that you're not. Let me give you an example. As a coach, as a coach and a competitive coach, I did not like losing. As a coach, there were games that stressed me out a lot. We still would end up winning, but emotionally and physically, I was exhausted. Anybody ever been there before? Amen. However, regardless of how I felt, we were still the victor at the end of the day. Amen. The fact that I was wore out didn't mean I didn't win. The fact that I didn't get stressed out in the third inning doesn't mean that I didn't win when the seventh inning was over. You understand? And so it doesn't matter how I'm feeling in the process of the battle. There have been times, I confess this to you, there have been times on Sunday mornings, my wife will tell you, uh, people that are closest to me will tell you, I've shared this with them, there have been times where I will leave here on certain Sundays and I just say, did anybody hear anything I just said? Did anybody receive it? Is anybody walking out the doors with it? And I just, I just don't 
feel like victory in that moment. And those are the days where it seems like the most the Holy Spirit will have some of you contact me who don't know I'm feeling like that and say, hey, that message was right on for me. God spoke to me in this situation. Now look, I felt like I didn't win, but I did. You understand? So you, you, you may be going through something in your life right now and you don't feel like you've won. Don't give up. Look at your neighbor and say, keep pushing. Look at your other neighbor and say, keep pushing. You, you've, really got to, you've really got to trust the fact that you're going to win. Here's why. Here's why. Because my father has never lost. Right? I mean, my heavenly father has never lost. And guess what? He's not going to lose just because he allowed me to be on his team. Do you remember when you picked teams as a child and you didn't want to pick that one kid that you knew was not going to help you be a winner? I always felt so bad for that kid until I started coaching. Like, I don't want them. You can have them. But don't we do that? I mean, we, 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 we sit here and we, we think about, well, what do we have to do from uh, what do we need to do to keep us from losing? But listen, we've already, we're fighting from victory. Amen. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not, con- listen to me, I'm not concerned for victory. I'm already fighting from a position of victory. Amen. I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the king. The Bible says he's already equipped me for every good work. He, he, he's already equipped me. I don't have to go out and buy a brand new baseball bat. I don't have to go out and get a new glove. I don't have to go out and get new sneakers or cleats or all types of equipment. I've already been equipped. When it comes spiritually, as a child of God, you've already been equipped according to to the text. You've already been equipped for every good work that you're ever going to come in contact with. You don't need to run out and get nothing else. Jesus Christ is all you need. And this is simply what it comes down to. He's our everything. And so I believe that God has called me here to encourage you today. You may not feel like you're winning right now, but nonetheless, you're the victor through Jesus Christ. Amen. You are the victor through Jesus Christ. Now, I know, and I, 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 because I hear it, I see it, I feel it, I know that there are a lot of people going through some very heavy things in life right now. I mean, you look around the church, not just here, uh, other churches, people, people are going through things in life right now. And I want to encourage you this morning, cry out to God. So if you're taking notes, jot that down, jot those four words down. Cry out to God. Because this is what it all comes down to. You say, Pastor, Pastor, I'm doing that. I am crying out to God. Then my message to you is keep crying out to God. Continue to cry out to God. You can never talk to him too much. So I want you to remember this morning that God is never going to leave you nor forsake you. And so as scripture says, so we say with confidence, my God is my helper. He's your refuge. He's, He's your safe place. Let's go back to Judges chapter 6 for a moment. Judges chapter 6, beginning with the 7th verse. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. I tell you, God is always so good to send you a message. Now listen to me, listen to me. If you're going through something and you're trusting in God, if you're not hearing a message, you're not listening long enough. You're not listening long enough, man. Continue to press, continue to be encouraged. Wait on the voice of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. So God is reminding them of what he had already done for them. Verse 9, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. And so God has told him, hey, this is your problem. This is one of your many problems. You're choosing to believe in false gods. Now listen to me, listen to me. God is looking for the same thing today that he was looking for from the Israelites back then. It's one word. Here it is. Obedience. 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 And this is what it comes down to. He says, I don't want to do what God says do. Well, that's selfish. That's pride. That's sin. That's sin. That's sin. I mean, think about it. The last time you told your children to do something and they looked at you and said, I don't want to do that. You said, oh, boy. 
say, what? I mean, if I'd have said that to my dad, I'd still be crawling right now. There's a good chance that it would still have an effect on my life if I'd have said that to my daddy. The one time, I mean, and I, 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 I was, my parents, they'll tell you I was nowhere near perfect. Amen? Um, but the one time I do remember getting really too ugly with my mom, um, she, I mean, I didn't even none to get the sentence out of my mouth, and my jaw went this way, my body went that way, and it was poof! And it hurt me, not because she threw a right hook. To this day, she says she don't remember it, but she did. It didn't hurt me because she threw one at me hurt me because I hurt her so bad that she felt she had to do that. Amen. And see, this is, this is where we've got to get to our place. We've got to understand, I want to know if I hurt the heart of my father. I, I want to know if I'm, if I'm doing something in my life that causes separation between me and God. And the reason I want to know is because the whole purpose I'm serving him is because of what he did for me through his son on the cross. And I do, with everything that I have, I do want to make it, and I do want to hear, well done, my good and faithful. Well done. I'm living to hear that. I'm not living to hear your thank yous. I'm not living to hear, oh, pastor, that was a great sermon. I'm not living to hear, thank you so much for doing this or for doing that. I'm not living for that. I'm living to hear, well done, because that's what Christ requires of me. Listen, that's not a faith of works. That's a faith of being obedient to be a servant to the Most High King. That's all it is. That's all it is. I'm not, I'm not forced into it. I've chosen to do it. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. I fall short too many times. But I've decided that I know that God is real. I know that Jesus came for me. And I'm willing to do and be as bold as whatever it is that he'll call me to do as long as he, through his spirit, gives me the power to do it. And that's where we need to be as a church. Amen. That's where we need to be as a church. Amen. I want to hear, well done. Anybody else with me on that endeavor? I want to hear, well done. I want to hear, well done. You know, I, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. If Christianity is fake, then what we're doing here today is wasting our time. If you can't come to grips that Jesus died for you on the cross, my friend, you're wasting your time. Amen. Listen, don't play church. Amen. Don't play church. If you're just being a Christian one day a week, you fooled yourself and you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. Come back to Christ when you're ready to give him your life. Amen. Right? Not, not, just, not just because you're ready to say, oh, Lord, save me from hell. Save me from hell. I'm scared to death to die. Save me from hell. Here's my soul. I said a prayer. I came up front. I got my Bible. I'm going home, and I'm going to come play that game once a week. No, no, no. Say, sometimes we got to save ourselves from our own self. Amen. <laughs> sometimes we got to save ourselves. We can be our own worst enemy, can't we? Amen. And so many people, so many people don't even realize they are the object of their own destruction. Amen. And the whole time, man, it's like God is saying, come over here to me. Come over here to me. Yeah. Come over here to me. And so I want every one of us to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I'm looking forward to that. And so God is calling and expecting us to the same call that he expects from Israel, and that's obedience. And the issue at hand, the issue at hand is that the people were not obeying the voice of God in their life. They were not doing what God had called them to do. And look at the 11th verse, Judges chapter 6. Verse 11, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at uh, Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of Abizarite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midians. And so he's beating out wheat, he's doing it in the wine press because the Midianites keep coming and taking and stealing everything that they have. And so he doesn't want them taking his food here. And so he's hiding in the wine press. Verse 12. And the angel of the Lord God appeared to him, and this is what the angel said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, Please, sir, if 
Everybody say if. Oh, that can be a dangerous word sometimes. What a lack of faith. And Gideon said to him, please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. Kind of what he's doing right there is trying to live off the backs of his ancestors. But people do that in church all the time. Amen. I can't tell you how many times I've approached someone and asked them uh, where their faith lies in. You know, ask them about Christ. Have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you go to church? And this is one that I get far too often. Well, you know my grandma goes to church. That's great for your granny. But uh, I said, do you go to church? Well, I used to go with her, you know, when I was dropped off at her house on the weekends. Yeah, but you're a grown man now. Amen. It don't look like you get dropped off on the weekends no more. Amen. And if you do, you need to grow up and be a man. Amen. Here's another one that I get far too often. This just happened a few weeks ago. <clears throat> I asked someone uh, if, they, if they had a relationship with Christ. They said, oh, yeah, 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 Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I said, that's great, man. Where do you fellowship at? Um, you know the church. Um, yeah, you know that church down. What's that road called? What's that road called? What? What? That's like, that's like asking someone what their last name is, and they don't know it. Because if this is your church, you ought to know that this is your family. If someone asks you where you go to church, listen, if you do not know the name of this church, when you leave here, you walk past your vehicle, and you go stand in front of that sign, and you let it burn an image into your heart. Because we're family. Amen. Can you imagine someone asking you what house, what, what road you live off of, and you can't remember your road? You, you don't remember. I'm not asking you to know the, 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 the street number out here. I'm not asking for all that. But know the family that you represent. Know the family that prays for you. Know the family that loves you. Know the family that wants you to be a part of it. Know the family that wants you to grow with it. Know the family that you should be serving one another with. Amen. I mean, you're here because family wants to love you. Amen? Amen? I mean, how fun would it be if you came here next Sunday and you were the only one in the room that I was yelling at? How lonely? How lonely would it be? Good gracious, don't know the name of the church. God has called Gideon. However, Gideon's got some things in his own personal life that needs to be dealt with. He's got some things going on, and again, just like us, he's not a perfect man either. He has a question that most people in life have probably asked God before. God, where are you in all this? And let me just encourage you for a moment. There is nothing wrong with asking God for the purpose or the reason. But what you cannot do in the process of asking God for a purpose or reason is doubt that he is in control. Amen. Now listen to me. Sometimes when you ask God for purpose or for reason, you're going to get an answer. And that's really good. There's going to be times when you don't. And that's still going to be really good. Amen. The reason it's still really good is because it can grow your faith. It can cause you to get stronger. It can cause you to press in. I don't know about you, but I don't like yelling through walls at the house. I can't hear. And so what I want to do is, is ask someone to come get closer to me or I go get closer to them. And so if you don't feel like you're hearing from the Lord today, it's an encouragement. Get closer. <laughs> Just get closer. Get closer. They say, oh, man, why is God not talking to me? Maybe he wants you closer. Amen. Just maybe he wants you closer. Yeah. Because if, if he, and he's fully capable of doing it, but if all he ever did was shout from heaven down into your heart, and your heart was so far from him, all he's doing is spoiling you. And I don't believe for one minute that my father is about spoiling his children. Amen. Anybody, don't point at nobody, but does anybody know any spoiled children? Yeah. It ain't never good, is it? It's never good. I, I've heard people say before, oh, God is so good to me, he spoiled me. I said, no, God never spoils anybody. Amen. No, 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 because that's rotten. When you look up the definition of spoiled, 
that's rotten. You don't want to be spoiled. You don't want to be spoiled. You need to understand that God wants a relationship with every one of us that is close and personal. Close and personal. He, he, he's, always having, he's always having the desire to talk to his people that are hungry and thirsty for him. But notice, notice, notice how God, notice, notice how Gideon says it when he says, where is God in all of this? Notice how he says it. He says, if God is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Church, listen to me. It's as if Gideon is not taking personal responsibility for the action. One thing is very clear. It's not God's fault. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, it ain't, it ain't God's fault. No matter what you're going through, it ain't God's fault. No matter what your sin is, it ain't God's fault. If you're struggling with addiction, it's not God's fault. Amen. If something didn't work out, it's not God's fault. If the marriage is failing, it's surely not God's fault. If you had any type of a religious ceremony, you made that covenant between you and God. Trust me, it's not God's fault if the covenant gets broken. It's Amen. not God's fault. That's not God's fault. God is faithful. What we cannot do is say amen, hallelujah, praise God, when we say God is faithful and get all excited about that. But then when we have a problem, act as though he isn't. Right? And so, so God is always faithful. So it's never God's fault. Let's just make that clear. And so here, Gideon, in, 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 in a sense, is like, hey, hey, where you were here when all this is going on, what's going on now? Let me tell you, never blame God. Amen. I don't care how bad it gets, never Amen. blame God. Never, never, never blame. Listen to me. Do you think that God is going to exile us when he sent his son down for us? Think about that. Now, we're talking New Testament living. New Testament. Anybody glad they're living in the New Testament? New Testament living. He sent his son down for you. He never leaves you nor what? forsakes you. You see, it's never God's fault. It's never God's fault. Amen. Judges chapter 6, look at the 14th verse. And the Lord turned to him and said, so Gideon basically just asked him, Where, where's God and all this? And the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you. And he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the what, church? Weakest. Now, you've got to get this. He says, behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Now listen to me, Midian felt weak and he felt unworthy. Amen. He felt weak and he felt unworthy. He said, my clan, oh no, we, we should not be the ones to go. We're small, we're weak. And he says, me, me, I'm just a weak man, me. And maybe you felt that way in your life before. So with that in mind, I want you to turn somewhere in the Bible. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 for a moment. Let's jump into the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's look at the 26th verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. <clears throat> this is really good. We're going to read this out loud together. <clears throat> it's on the screen if you don't have a Bible in front of you. Let's read it out loud. One, two, three, go. Four. Stop right there. Not many of you were what? I've shared with you before, I was in honors classes uh, for one, one school year. It wasn't even a full year. I lasted like a semester and they kicked me back down to normal classes. I'm, not, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just not super smart, all right? I, I'm the type, rather than tell me something, I would rather you show me something. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Tell me how to do it. I'm liable to leave there like, oh, man, confused. But show me how to do it, and I got a lot better chance of not breaking your stuff. Amen? All right. So back at the beginning, one, two, three, go. For consider your calling, brothers. Not we're wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. 
Stop right there. Keep it up there for a minute. <clears throat> Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Hey, thank God. See, it's not, it's not our standard and it's not the world standard that we're trying to hit. Can you say amen to that? And so listen, we're not even being judged through the eyes of God on the standards of the world. Let's get it back up there. For consider your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful according to worldly standards. Not many of you were of what? Noble birth. So keep that up there. That means, and I believe it's probably talking to every one of us in this room can fit in this category, right? That we're not super wise according to worldly standards. We're not very powerful individuals concerning the worldly standards. And no one up in here is of noble birth, last I checked. Amen? I mean, raise a hand if your daddy's a king or something like that. Right? Right? So this is what it comes down to. I'm so thankful that my boxes that are checked off, my resume, if you will, and your resume have nothing to do with things of the world. I'm thankful for that. Let's get it back up there. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. Keep going. Read this out loud. One, two, three, go. But God chose the foolish world. Stop right there. How many of us understand before we were saved, we were some foolish people? Yep, 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 yep. Some of you went to school with each other. You noticed some foolish people was up in here. Some of you went to school with each other. You knew what they were doing. And we were acting foolish. We were living in sin. Go ahead and get it up there again. But God chose what? What is foolish in the world to shame the wise God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. See, what we don't want to do is be like Gideon and say we're not good enough. Amen. Listen to me. Whatever excuse you're using to not be used by God could be the exact reason God wants to use you. Amen. Now, I'm going to say that again. You've got to hear that clearly, loud and clearly. Yes. Whatever excuse you may be using to not serve and live for God could be the exact reason God wants to use you. You say, Pastor, but it's my sin. How could God want to use my sin? God has nothing to do with sin. Yes, you're right. God has nothing to do with sin. So what God wants to do is rescue you from that sin so that now you become a testimony to all your buddies, to all your family, to all the community, to all the friends, to all your neighbors, that when he rescues you from that lifestyle of sin, People have to look and say, how did he, how did she do that? And your response is, that was nothing else but the hand of God. And so whatever excuse you're using to keep yourself from being obedient to the Father, let God use it for his glory. Let God use it for his glory. Midian says, Midian says, man, my clan is weak, we're small. We're not going to be able to make this happen. We're the smallest ones. Listen, why do you think God chose the smallest one? He's about to get glory through it. Would it have been really easy for God to have called upon the biggest clan? Yes! But then they could have got praise and credit for it. God says, I'm going to the, I'm going to the smallest. And my message, watch this, and my message is going through the weakest. I think that God really enjoys working in people's weak moments. Amen. Not because he enjoys seeing weak people, but because he enjoys giving weak people his power to become strong. Amen. I really enjoy it. As a coach, I, 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 I love seeing people hit well, but what I love better than that is teaching them to hit well. Amen. I love that. I love that. The art of teaching to me is more important than putting into practice what you've been taught when it comes to baseball, not spiritual. I'm just trying to give you an example here. I would rather teach someone how to knock a ball into the grass than go watch them knock the ball into the grass. I just get joy teaching how to do it the right way. Now we can look at it spiritually. We need to do both. It's twofold, really. We need to enjoy the process of being trained, but even more so in our training, we need to look with great anticip anticipation the act of going out there and putting into practice what we've been trained upon. And so it really is a beautiful thing that works 
together. Judges chapter 6, verse 17. Go there with me. I just love the fact, church, that God loves to take someone who feels unusable and use them. I love the fact that God loves to take people that feel unloved and love on them. I mean, it's just amazing what God is willing to do through his people. Amen? Judges chapter 6 and the 17th verse. Let's go there. And he said to him, and so Gideon responds to God. He says, if now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour and the meat he put in a basket and the broth he put in a pot and brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and your broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. And then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord God. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, peace be to you. Do not fear, you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace. And to this day it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abizrites. What a tremendous lesson Gideon has learned that day. How many of you know and you've understand in your walk with Christ that God is all about teaching us lessons as we go through walking life with him. He's all about teaching us lessons, man. Gideon needed peace, you understand? He's still real nervous. I mean, he don't have a whole lot of fighters. He don't have a whole lot of strong men. He doesn't have this great vast army in his clan. He's nervous, and he needs peace. Let me just encourage you, God always gives what you're in need of. And so he was in need of peace, and he gives him peace. He was nervous, the truth is, he's nervous, Gideon is, about the entire idea. He's nervous about everything that God has told him. But by the end of it all, listen to me, by the end of it all, after spending time with God, Gideon's stance is this. Gideon says, the Lord is peace. The Lord is peace. You see, it doesn't matter what we're going through in life right now. When you spend good quality time with God, we always feel the presence of his peace. Again, I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter if you got bad news from a doctor. It doesn't matter what your spouse just told you. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with. Listen, if you're willing to spend time with God, he will offer you his peace. And here's why he offers you his peace, because he wants you thinking with a clear head. He doesn't want you operating out of the sickness of the heart. The Bible says the Bible says the heart is sick. He doesn't want you operating out of the sickness of your heart. He doesn't want you operating out of the thoughts of, of a carnal mind. God offers peace. And so, so much so, he builds this altar and he calls it, the Lord is peace. Gideon needed peace over the situation. And maybe you're here today and you need some peace over your situation and whatever you're going through. Maybe it's a, a decision process. Maybe it's not a storm. Maybe you're just trying to make a, a decision. Is it a good decision? Is it a bad decision? And you just need peace. Isn't it so awesome that God gives us exactly what we need? If you've not experienced that yet, maybe it's simply because, listen to me, maybe it's simply because you're looking for what you want rather than what God wants to give you. Maybe you're too busy looking for what you want rather than what God wants to give you. So look at the 25th verse, Judges 6, 25. That night, the Lord said to him, take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is beside it 
and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. And so Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. So you say, whoa, he's finally being obedient. But watch this, verse 27. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he what? God has called Gideon to tear down the altar to Baal and the Asherah. Gideon, Gideon wants to be obedient, but he wrongfully tries to be obedient in secret. Listen, church, either you're going to stand up for God or you're not. Stop hiding in your faith. Either you're going to stand up for God or you're not. And so it's real easy at this point. He says, hey, I did what God told me to do. Yeah, but you did what God told you to do your way. Amen. Not his way. Amen. And then, yeah, yeah, but I said my blessing in the workplace. Yeah, but that's just simply because people came in and you said, well, I'm not going to do it and bow my head like I normally do. I'll just keep my eyes open and look around the room and just say it quietly to myself. All about changing what we do to honor God simply because the world has crept in. Amen. We're either going to stand up for God or we're not. It's really easy when you get around a bunch of Christians to tell people you're blessed, isn't it? And then, and then when you leave here, God forbid that vocabulary changes. I mean, we, we, don't, need, we don't just need to be the light in the church. Amen. We got to be the light where? in the world and so here God has called Gideon to tear it down and he says okay I'll tear it down but I'm gonna do it how I want to do it listen to me the last thing the last thing the absolute last thing this world needs is undercover Christians that's it the last thing we need at a time like this is undercover Christianity where everyone in church knows you're a believer but no one on the outside of the church does. Does your family know you love Christ? Does your, do your aunts and your uncles, does the extended family know you love Christ? At the family reunion, do they know that you stand for Christ? Or are you still known as that crazy uncle Ray or whoever? Crazy uncle Jimmy, crazy uncle Billy. Or have they understood that you're no longer crazy, Amen. but you're serving a king named Jesus Christ? Because there's great testimony in that. There's great gain in that. There's great glory given to the Father in that. Go to Matthew chapter 5 quickly with me. Many of you know it. We're going to go there just to reference it so that you can be encouraged. Matthew chapter 5, look at the 14th verse. Here's a great responsibility for every one of us in this room. A great responsibility. Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world, Jesus says to us. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before who? Others, so that they may see your what? Good works, and give glory to who? Your Father who is in heaven. Gideon's dad was a worshiper of Baal. Gideon's family was a worshiper of Baal. Gideon did not want to dishonor his dad, and so he risked dishonoring his father, God. I think the church is in trouble when we try to walk a fine line. Listen, it's either, it either is for God or it's not. It's either righteous or it's unrighteous. It's either holy or it's unholy. It's either sin or it's not. It's, it's either obedience or it's disobedience. You say, oh, come on, pastor. Come on, man. We're living in a different day. No, no, no. We still serve the same God throughout Amen. all of it. 
And that's not me trying to bring down the hammer on anyone's home. That's not me trying to bring down the hammer on anyone's head. That's me trying to give you the truth because God's word has never changed and it never will change. And that's me trying to tell you that I have a call to give you the truth so that when I get to heaven, I hear, well done. Because I told you earlier, that's all I'm looking to hear. That's all I'm looking to hear. I've shared this before. And I still stand on it. When I get there, I'm making sure that I get there. Amen? You know, Pastor, don't you know you're saved? Don't you know you're getting in? Yeah, but I ain't going to waste no time in the back of the line. I mean, in high school, we all tried to drift to the back of the line, didn't we? Teacher be looking. She turned away. You hop back another couple steps. Make yourself at the back of the line all the time. Maybe because when you come outside from recess, you wanted to be at the water fountain the longest. I couldn't stand the teachers that would count. One, two, next. One, two, next. Two seconds for a sip. See, it may sound crazy, but y'all know, and I mentioned this a few weeks ago, y'all know when you go to a restaurant, you want to be first in before everybody else. When you go to Walmart, you look for the shortest line, don't you? When, when you go to the grocery store, you look for the shortest route, don't you? Don't you? Nobody says, hey, sweetie, let's go get the longest line, see how long it takes. The other day, we needed pickles, and we had our cart full. We need to add pickles to the cart, and the wife says, hey, do you want to go get some pickles? I said, no, I got a better plan than that. You go get the pickles. I'm going to wait in line. When I get to heaven, I'm excited about being there. I've lived this life to be there. I want to get in. When I get in, I'll start looking for y'all. But until then, I'm making sure that I'm in. When I go to a restaurant, when you go to a restaurant, you don't stand outside the building. Say, I wonder who's in there from Amelia. Let's look. Hey, sweetie, I'll tell you what, rather than go inside, why don't you and the boys, why don't y'all go look in the windows? Peek through the windows, tell me who's in there. No! I'm heading for the door! I'm heading for the door! And this is where we need to be, man. You've got to understand. Let me just ask you a question. Don't answer it out loud. Just consider it. How bad do you want to be there? How bad do you want to be there? Because if heaven is just some dreamy place that keeps you out of hell, you don't understand what it is. Amen. How bad do you want to be in the presence of God? How bad do you want to be before the king who laid down his life? How bad do you want to bow before him and worship? Amen. How bad do you want to touch the feet of the one who bled for you, got beat for you, yeah. died for you, yeah. defeated death for you, rose up for you, yeah. coming back for you. Have you considered this lately? How bad do you want to touch the feet of your king? How bad? Yeah. How bad? Yeah. I think when we begin to focus on that, I think it begins to change how we live. Amen. Go back to Judges with me. Chapter 6, verse 28. When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down and the Asherah beside it was cut down and the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, what has done this thing? Who? Who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. And the men of the town said to Joash, bring out your son that he may die, for he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, lowercase g, speaking of a false god, Baal, if he is a god, let him contend for himself, because his altar has been broken down. Therefore, on that day, Gideon was called Jerubel. That is to say, let Baal contend against him, because he broke down his altar. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together and they crossed the Jordan and encamped into the valley of Jezreel. 
but the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. Listen to me. We're going to close in a moment, and I have to get you to understand this before we do. Verse 34, but the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet, and the Asperites were called out to follow him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him, and he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they went up to meet him. Let's take some time to focus on the 34th verse. Look at it. Judges 6, 34 says, The Spirit of the Lord God clothed Gideon. Jot this down if you're taking notes. In Galatians chapter 3 and in Romans chapter 13, Paul references Christians being clothed in Christ. This brings an emphasis to our union with Christ, number one. Being clothed with Christ brings an emphasis to our union with Christ. And that takes place at our conversion. That takes place of us saying, Lord, save my soul. But being clothed with Christ uh, also portrays the transformation that takes place due to our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so when I'm clothed in Christ, my speech should want to change. My thought process should want to change. How I interact with people should change. How I receive things should change. The way that I do things should change. The way that I live my life should change. This is what it's all about, being clothed in Christ. Because I am saved, we, we as being saved have been equipped and made ready to take on and face any and everything that would ever come up against us. Remember, remember what we said earlier, winning at times may be really hard, but we're always trusting in God to see us through to the end for the win. You understand? Yeah. Now, God clothed Gideon, that's what it says. And he clothes us today through his son, Jesus Christ, as well. Jesus Christ as well. We are to be clothed in Christ. For the same reason Gideon was clothed. Don't miss this. Amen. We are to be clothed in Christ for the same reason Gideon was clothed. For reassurance and victory. Amen. And if you're taking notes, jot those two words down. Reassurance, victory. This is why we are clothed in Christ. Reassurance and victory. At the end of the 34th verse, if you look at it, at the end of the 34th verse, it says that the trumpet was sounded. The trumpet was sounded. Everybody say that. The trumpet. Hmm. I've got a trumpet. In the Greek text, that's not a silver trumpet it's speaking of. It's this type of trumpet. And we have some visitors here. This is a horn that's cut off the head of an animal. The meat rots out. And they had many different blasts when they would sound this trumpet. Particular blasts meant different things. A call to war, a call to arms. The war is over. The enemy is coming. They're on the horizon. Uh, Jesus is king of all kings, lord of all lords. We're broken before God Almighty. It would sound at festivals and, and holidays and fest, uh, festivities and different things that were taking place. And it said that he sounded the trumpet. As I was studying this, the Holy Spirit just quickened in me. And he's just showing me that our lives are trumpet blasts. If living like Christ is clothing me, then living a life worthy of the king is a blast for the king. Amen. You ever heard the expression, actions speak louder than what? Amen. And so you can simply be a trumpet call to the lost. Your life can be a trumpet blast to the lost by showing them the love of Jesus Christ, but not just to the lost. You living your faith out loud can be an encouragement, a blast of encouragement to the person in the next aisle over. I was at a basketball the other night, and a young man who I did not know, he was on the other team, he had scripture from Deuteronomy written across the soles of his shoe. And during a timeout, they had an inbound pass, and he comes over right there on the floor beside me. I tell you, man, you got scripture on shoes. I'm like, I was so blessed by reading. I'm at a basketball game getting scripture, and I looked at my wife. I said, hey, boo, 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 look. 
He got scripture on his shoes. He did that with his own Sharpie marker. How cool is that? How cool is that? And after the game, I made it a point to go across the court and tap that young man on the shoulder. And I said, let me tell you something, man. I said, I'm real proud of you for putting the word of God out there on this platform that he has given you in high school basketball. I think what you're doing is amazing, and that scripture has encouraged me. See, that was his trumpet, if you will, blasting forth for me. So when you leave here today, let me encourage you. When you leave here today, how will your trumpet blast? Will it be a blast of peace, of love, of affirmation? Will you be there for others when they need you? How will your trumpet call out today? Let's stand and pray. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity that you've given us to come into your word today. Thank you, Lord. I don't know, church. I don't know if you've I don't know if you've already read it or not, but let me just share a number with you real quick. Gideon is going to face 135,000 men. Think about that. He's going to face well over 100,000 people in the enemy's camp. Gideon needs to get moving. God gave a message to Zerubbabel that I feel is fitting for this moment, and you can find it in Zechariah chapter 4 and the 6th verse. And Zechariah 4, 6, God says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit says the Lord God of hosts. So I want to love you and encourage you that if you feel like you cannot make it on your own, you're exactly right. You can't. And I can't either. Now all you have to do is trust in God and allow His Holy Spirit's power and love to operate within your life. There was a well-known pastor by the name of D.L. Moody. A group of pastors had gotten together and they're talking about inviting D.L. Moody into their city to speak at a revival. One of the pastors, maybe getting a little jealous, says, why must it be Moody? Why must D.L. Moody be the one to come to our city? Does he have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? And then one of the other pastors in the room simply spoke up and replied the following. No, DL does not have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. But it is evident through his life that the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on DL Moody. Either you're going to live like Jesus is your king or you won't. Either you're going to sound the trumpet call from your life or you won't. Father, I pray in the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ that we would live this life, this one life that you've given us on this earth, and we would give it everything we've got and more so because we would not be operating under our own authority, under our own ideas, under our own plans, under our own agendas, but we would truly surrender to your will for our lives. God, I pray that we would be hungry and thirsty after your righteousness, and you tell us you tell us through your son, Jesus Christ, that if we would hunger and thirst after your righteousness, you would fulfill us. You would satisfy us. And so, Lord, I pray that you make us hungry. Make us hungry. Make us thirsty. If there's anyone in this room that has never surrendered to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, let me tell you something. I don't care, and most importantly, God doesn't care how far you've run. God doesn't care how low you've been. God is not concerned with your sin. He's concerned for your soul. I don't want you in here believing the lie that you can fix yourself first, that you can get right first and then come to Christ. It'll never happen. Because you could never get right unless you've got Christ in your life. 
And so if you're here today and you're ready to just surrender, you're ready to say, you know what, Pastor, I hear what you're saying, and I've, I got to give my life over to Jesus, man. I've, <laughs> I've been trying to do it on my own, and I'm tired of struggling. I want my life to be better. I want my marriage to be better. I want my relationship with my children to be better. I know, I know that I'm not doing what I need to be doing, and I need to surrender to Jesus. If that's you, I welcome you to raise your hand right now. If you say, you know what, you know what, I need more of Jesus. I need, I need him to save my soul. He's the only one, and he is the only way. He is the only way. Friends, there's going to come a day where either you perish or Christ returns, whatever happens first, and you're going to be standing there, and I pray that you hear, well done. Well done. God, as your people go forward, I pray, Father, that they would understand that in their blessing, they are sanctified, they are holy, they are set apart. May we live like it, may we act like it. May we sound the trumpet call of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. In the precious name and the blood of our Lord Jesus, everyone said together, amen, amen, and amen. Let's give God a clap of praise, hallelujah. He is worthy, he is worthy, he is worthy. To God be the glory. Amen. Have a wonderful.